Welcome to Thrive Radio. I'm your host, Amy Montgomery, entrepreneur and digital marketing agency owner. Today, my guest is Trevor Tomian. He is the founder and lead facilitator at Common Leaders. He helps businesses with leadership development, screening, and hiring while helping individuals stand out and get hired. Trevor, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Amy. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to speak with your guests, and I really appreciate everybody listening that does. Yeah. So how can, how did you become a consultant and a coach? Fortune, opportunity. (laughs) I've been very fortunate to have great mentors most of my life and most of my career at different levels, starting with parents who got me going enough and got me into leadership activities early on. I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, and that led me to FFA, what that is, Future Farmers of America. And I look back on that now and it sounds so cheesy because a lot of FFA is very corny, pun (laughs) intended, but I got exposed to very basic leadership stuff early on, even when I wasn't very skilled in communication and I was a terrible student, but I got exposed to leadership skills early on. And that kind of propelled me to those opportunities at every step I took along the way. And I had great mentors that were coaches and I had great mentors that were teachers. So I, by nature of that, want to emulate them. I wanted to pass it along. So I think I do it because I've been fortunate and because I can be good at it sometimes. <laughs> In walking through your journey, what are you grateful for now? As I said, mentors have meant the world to me. I'm a, again, terrible student. So having good human interactions, you, know, you and I have had today already and will continue to, That has been so impactful and profound in my life. So I'm mostly grateful for the people who have been willing to give me a chance to talk. When I sit back and party, don't really, and have never really felt like I deserved any time or deserved a shot and someone would give me a shot. And sometimes it was 30 seconds long. You just get a little window and somehow somebody invites you into whatever they're doing. And I'm really grateful for those little windows and then having great support people around me. So some people have, don't know their parents. Some people have two parents. I had four parents. I had a mom, a dad, and I had two step parents essentially my whole life. And along with that came more grandparents. <laughs> and even though I've moved really far from what really all of them do, having that support was really critical because if one parent was kind of slacking people, humans make mistakes and humans have setbacks. Yeah. Is that I think there was always somebody there to re-inspire me that it was okay. So I was really lucky that even in tough moments, I had some people around me. It's amazing. So what is the most important communication skill you can have? Hmm. See, I did a thing that I've learned how to do in time, which is I had four answers at once. And then I thought about it for just a second, <laughs> which leads <laughs> me to that. what that thing is. is. Sometimes listening is the best communication skill. And I think in addition to listening is asking questions and having the right questions. So I don't think listening is super valuable without questions because then it just stays in your head, whatever you're thinking about. Mm-hmm. And I also don't think questions are super worthwhile if you're not listening well. So I would say the greatest communication skill is the combined activity of being a good listener and a practiced listener with a notebook all the time, and also being able to turn what you're hearing into a question to the person to either validate them if that's what you're looking to do or to learn more about them if that's what you're looking to do. But it serves you a purpose to learn and it serves them a purpose to validate what they put efforts into. I think it's just a lovely exchange you get to have when you can listen, truly listen to the words people say, and then ask more. (laughs) Yeah. And then I think it, it makes them feel you actually listened. Yeah. And and you do worst case scenario, you get a bad movie recommendation, best case scenario. You learn something you never heard before. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So how does negotiation skills help you in business? Oh, negotiation on the financial front is really tough for me. So I will say that it gets in my way. And if I had it, it would be very helpful. It would reduce a big stressor for me. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like the exchange piece of money. I want things just like everybody, like most other people do. I'm not going to pretend I'm a minimalist. I'm somewhere north of minimalist, I would say. But on the the exchange or the negotiation front of, of people is really where I love being. And again, where I've had great mentorship and tools along the way to, to negotiate human relations. And I have had my official business for all of five months and I've been actively working on it for three or four. So not very long. 
in the context of a life, hopefully. But the relationships I've been able to make and, and do my best to maintain and to really nurture and to care, genuinely care about the other person. And instead of getting overwhelmed with having a million followers, just get overwhelmed with the 10 or 15 that I have has worked out really, really well so far. So negotiating human relations has been extremely valuable in that way. And it's in somewhat ways truly made up the deficit I have in financial negotiations, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that because that, that part is still scary to me. So I hope, I hope to get some more help in that area because it's important, but I hate doing it. And right now I'm just relying uh, real heavily on people skills. <laughs> yeah, I think that the financial stuff, I've experienced that where it's been a struggle as well. My business isn't that old. And I think that, yeah, it's a lot of people talk about the confidence of the services you provide and all of that. But I think that there's more to it because it's also you want to make sure that you're giving a fair price, that you're giving the market price or whatever it may be. There was somebody that came on my podcast that gave some really good advice and he had said, go and Google your industry and find out what the net profit is. And there, it'll be percentage. Mm. And he says, let's say it says that the profit percentage, it's, it's 10%. He says, you don't want to be 10% because there's someone that's going to be at zero. There's somebody that's going to be at 10. There's somebody that's going to be at 20. He says, mm-hmm. you want to be 13 or 15%. Right. And I thought that was really insightful. So you don't want to be, because I would go out there and go, okay, what's in the middle Mm. And what, and then, and, and evaluate yeah. where my business was, what I thought I could offer all of this kind of stuff. And what I found out really quickly was that even if I was offering my services um, at say a, a lower price than a competitor, there are still some people that aren't going to be able to afford that. Yeah. And then there's other people that's a perfect price for them. Mm-hmm. And it's that people pleasing thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent agree. My fr- we are very much on the same page with that. I have spent more time being afraid to invoice people and having that be the primary barrier in my world truly, because if you couldn't tell, I think we're both connectors. Yeah. We want to, we want to build people up and that's our kind of accidental life's work. Maybe in some ways is to, is to just be a part of other people's world. And, in in our version, that means pushing them with their business a lot of times or pushing whatever their goals are in life and hyping them up and making them feel great. And so you almost immediately by nature of requirement for what we are trying to accomplish as humans, build a connection, a good, genuine connection. And then to ask for uh, this money piece is so uncomfortable to do because it's rare that somebody's like, oh yeah, I have so much extra money laying around. But I mean, yeah. whether they're a, a really wealthy, successful business person or whether they're on the streets, it's very rare somebody would be, oh yeah, I have enough. Why don't you take some extra? Take as much as, oh no, that doesn't feel good. But if you have it, I want to give you, I want to give you the high price and I want to subsidize the lower ones. And how do I do that? Yeah. It but is- then you get so caught up in that web. Yeah, it it is really tricky. I, I think it just is all over the place and it just depends on the individual you're working with. And I think that even in my process, I can bring people through sort of a strategy and we figure out what's going to work for their business specifically mm-hmm. and what they can afford with their budget. I think even in that process, uh, that's it's still difficult because if they want me to price out certain things, I'll be upfront with them. If you have, if you pay me to do this, it's going to be around this range and not everything is in the thousands of thousands and thousands of dollars, but, right. but it does, you sit there and think if it were me, would I buy that? <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know, no, 100%. Maybe I wouldn't. You may be, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you just spoke truth to it because sometimes the difference is because, uh, again, I'll speak to probably for both of us, our mentors and the people who had a big influence on us, what they would have done in a lot of scenarios is go get a book on it and learn it themselves and figure out how to help people with it. Because if it's something I want, then it's also something that I don't want to, I want to monetize and pay for. You have all those, yeah, that subtle little voice that's trying to make a strategic plan for all those little things. Yeah. That's crazy. So what types of high level education have you noticed is not available to everyone? I know you're passionate about getting that out to more people. 
Yeah, I was like, this is a great question, Amy. Where'd you come up with that one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what you and I talked about, but last time we talked and a little bit today before we start recording the communication piece, and we talked a little bit about it during the recording, the communication skills, I think, aren't available um, to most people. I think you have to be, you have to be very fortunate. And I consider myself that you have to be very fortunate to come across understanding human behavior and communications at a, at a usable level. If you take some psych classes in undergrad, I think you might start to understand the why that people do things. But I don't think it's until beyond that, whether it's formal or informal education, when you get to that higher, deeper level of understanding of how you operationalize human psychology that is when you really start to understand how to communicate very effectively. And I think that because it is so high level to understand it at that depth, that it is automatically not given to anybody else. And I think that's stupid. I think it sucks. And I don't think it's fair if there's a fairness to be had <laughs> in this sense, because fairness is such an odd word, but there's no equity. There's no quality in how people understand how to communicate. So what is really important to me is as I continue to build common leaders and build out the things I'm interested in general and meet people yourself is constantly be trying to find a way to take very high level communication skills and leadership skills, which crosses a lot of boundaries, a lot of disciplines, and turn those into usable tools for people. Use the, this is going to sound a little sketchy but use the human manipulation skills that exist to get people interested in learning about communication and leadership. <laughs> I want to draw people in and I want to give them tools that will just supercharge whatever they're trying to get out of life. And supercharge is a varied word. It doesn't have to be big and aspirational. It can just mean happier. But once you understand, I think, how to communicate, how to listen to people, how to ask questions, how to advocate for yourself, even if you're not assertive, there's all sorts of things that I think are usable, practical tools in daily communication that could really help people be more fulfilled. Um, and I don't think you should have to go to grad school to do it. I don't think you should have to um, work at a huge company to get that training. So thank you for letting me be on my soapbox on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I think that's really, really good. And you're right. Not everybody knows. And I think that especially the psychology and some of the, we were talking about manipulation. I remember I was reading one book, I can't remember the name of it now, but they were talking about how they make changes in society and they might come up to your door and ask you to sign a petition to, I don't know, put a stop sign or yeah, up in the neighborhood and you're like, yeah, okay. Stop sign. And then they'll add a little increment to that. Oh, here's a, a it's part of the same program. And here's one just to put a pole up. Oh, we've got a pole. Okay. Okay. And then it's okay. Now we're going to install a cell site and people will oh. sign mm -hmm. it and agree to it because mm -hmm. they don't want to disagree with themselves, their initial decision. And, mm -hmm. and unless you understand that manipulation and, and it's why the higher hard Krishners used to be at the airports and they'd hand people flowers mm -hmm. as they walked by. And then people would give money because they felt they had to give back. Right. Wow. And that's how they raise money. And so it's in uh, vacuum salesmen did do that all the time. They'll go to someone's yeah. house and say, well, let me demonstrate this project. And they'll either make a mess or they'll clean up a mess in the, in there. Let me, where do you need the, um, something cleaned? And they'll go and they'll clean it. Now, all of a sudden that person feels, oh, wow, they just cleaned my living room. I feel I need to give them something. Mm-hmm. And it's that psychology. And so if you don't understand that psychology, and they even did it, I think, in concentration camps in China to victims of their, that were captured, soldiers that were captured in war. Mm -hmm. And they would get them to sign their name on things. And they would get them to do micro agreements. And then the number one thing, though, to break all of that, once you understand it, is that to realize you are not your decisions. So if I make a decision, someone comes to my house and says, I want you to sign this petition. You think, oh, this is a good idea. And you realize later on, now they're asking for this huge commitment. You can still be aligned with who you are mm -hmm. and say no. 
because you are not your decisions. You didn't know it. What now? Yeah. Yeah. No, that you just broke down an entire, an entire pyramid scheme and everything. (laughs) I mean, it's, I don't, that's not what it's called, but it's kind of the same vibes Yeah. in terms of, it's not that that those strategies are inherently evil or bad. It's when they're used for, for, yeah, well, that, that is an interesting question of ethics of where good and bad is and how those lines are drawn Mm -hmm. and how you operate in a world where if I have, if I have the most healthy, nutritious apple ever created, and if you take this and grow it in your backyard, you'll, you'll have food forever. You'll never have to worry about buying food again. And you take the apple, it, was that manipulation in a bad way? And where do those boundaries fall? Because now that person does, unless you're aware of what they just did to you, in the whole, in the whole scope of it, which is partly manipulation, and, but partly something you do actually need, is the next time they come, you're going to be more likely to say yes to them. You're saying because you've already committed. And so while they were using that tactic in part, because they knew it was going to help you, you still got. Yeah. You still got, got. And because there's such a need for you to stay congruent to yourself. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I, I, I think that we've seen a little bit of that during the pandemic because they've wanted to change how things are done. What's an easy way to do that? Micro commitments. Yeah. 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 And then, and it starts, I think from a good place, it, just government in general, at least in the United States, I don't want to speak for countries I don't understand, but in the United States, <clears throat> you say yes to a politician for the right reasons early on. And then you just keep reelecting that same SOB over and over again, even though there's maybe options that align better with you. You just keep on going back to that same well, that's giving you muddy water. Well, and, and here's the thing is that there's good and evil mixed in. Yeah. yeah. So there could be somebody that made a, a, a good decision, right? They made a, a wise, a good decision. And then there's the evil person over there going, well, this is an opportunity. Sure, right. Sure. So you've got all of that mixture that's in that. And if you aren't on top of it, you won't be able to decipher what, what's what. Yeah. 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 It is a bizarro world. It really? Is. I mean, it, it just is. It's a very deep world. And I think truly that's why I think that those skills can be so helpful because if you can get people into the initial phases of understanding communication, it may just be utilitarian enough to help them. And that's all they ever understand is some basic, you're not going to pitch it as academia because that's not going to work, but you find a way to pitch it in a way that could help people through their day-to-day life and their relationships, which also got worse during the pandemic, abuse and things like that, yeah. to help empower people with whatever mode of communication they have access to, whether it's words or typing or all the things, and just give them some better skills for it. And once you open that door, I think you also open up people to do what happened with us, maybe a little bit more so, especially you, is you run down the rabbit hole or get taken down the rabbit hole of understanding it at a very deep level. And it's painful to understand those things, I think. And it's a huge burden to understand those things and not abuse them. But it's also so empowering because, and and you can help people in a very different way because you understand how to get their attention now. Yeah. Like like it's, it can be really powerful and helpful. Yeah. Uh, And that's why I think it would be important because we talk about underserved communities when we talk politics and economic development, especially in Southern California, there's because there's been homelessness here since before it was cool everywhere else. And I just think that it could be more valuable to help people more valuable than a STEMI check is (laughs) It's to have access to communication skills. In what ways do you make the type of education that we were talking about communication more accessible to people? Certainly the ways I'm striving to are by not asking for a whole lot of money for anything, first and foremost, <laughs> as we talked about earlier, it's not a natural state for me. So I'm trying to leverage, leverage my uncomfortability, I guess, in some ways to springboard this initiative and to springboard this topic into the world and say, <clears throat> honestly, to say yes to as many opportunities as possible, as long as they align with my value system. Because as long as they align with the same value system that created this company called Common Leaders, my hope is uh, it will in some way support it. <clears throat> it's in, from your own business consulting and, and org development, both internally and as a consultant, from what I gather, you understand the power of a good vision. 
Yeah. Uh, and having good core values. And I think if you have a good core value of something with the word access, and you just beat that into your head a bunch of times, I have. <laughs> and that, and then you have a vision of how to utilize your, your strengths and the areas you're interested in. Uh, then you can turn it into a pretty big deal. See Elon Musk, dude is brilliant with physics, had a vision to go to Mars. And you just slowly, not that I'm Elon Musk or either of us are ever going to be, <laughs> but you, you can slowly bring those together. And in my case, that's largely what has happened. And right now my actual, cause that's the philosophy, right? Yeah. Well, how are you actually doing it <laughs> is very multimedia driven. So in an area where we only talk about digital media and we only think video has to be on everything. And we only think social media and the, tr and whatever is the hottest thing of TikTok right now, for instance, is the one everybody's using. It's a cool one to be on and to just say, I'm going to utilize all of them. <laughs> and I'm going to try, I'm going to try my darndest to, <laughs> to make this PG first of all, and also to build a foundation to a company in terms of outreach, in terms of places that somebody could plug into. I want to build them in as many places that I can afford to build them. <laughs> so in the podcast world, in the social media world, on all the platforms, I laughed at a comment you made about Pinterest because I have a Pinterest and I learned that how important Pinterest is to SEO, yeah. to search engine optimization. It's right after YouTube, which is right after Google. And I'm and when I tell people that it's revolutionary, if it's never heard it before, so how is Pinterest this beast in the industry? But I have a Pinterest because I want to build a platform for this material and for voices that are much smarter than me. I want to get that to as many people as possible and have common leaders be the vehicle for it. And the other how in terms of that is by bringing is not having too big of, an e big of an ego around leadership and around communication and, and just invite people to be a part of the conversation, ideally that come from different backgrounds than me. And it's funny because somebody once told me to get over myself and it was some of the hardest advice I ever took because I didn't know what it meant. I was a little bit before my time to be comfortable with what that meant for me. Yeah. And I think I'm getting closer. I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm getting closer and common leaders is an attempt to do that in some ways of invite as many diverse voices, because if they deliver a message of, of empowerment better than I can, of a message of communication better than I can, then I want them to join me and deliver that message. And I will shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. want all the people. <laughs> Well, and a little shameless plug here for yeah. Pinterest. I actually have a Facebook group that is all the Tailwind Tribe groups. So I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Tailwind Tribes. So, I so tail the Tailwind app, they have what's called tribes. And the tribes, they gather together by niche and they share each other's pins and pin each other's stuff to their boards so that you get even more um, traffic to your website. No kidding. Yeah. So it's the easy button. So I have a Facebook group. It's not, somebody gave it, handed it to me and they said, here you go. It's got a few thousand people in it. And I'm trying to get more pe people active and start sharing their work and their pins and all that kind of stuff, because it's, it, they didn't do that prior, but, but yeah, so you can uh, join that. And it's under uh, Pinterest tribes, Tailwind Print and Pinterest tribes. And, and you have a group that's dedicated or your group talked about that is what you're so saying. My, you my, the whole of... group, that's all it is just oh. all the people that are in those groups. And then we have a full on list of all the different niches and different and links to the different groups in there uh, again. Okay. But if you go to the, in the tailwind app, they're listed in there too, but it's just a, a Facebook group for people to actually connect to each other. And if you have technical issues or struggles or whatever. Sweet. I'm going to definitely ask you to share me the hyperlink when we're yeah. done because yeah. I want to check that out. That sounds cool. And Pinterest is a really unique one too. And I was actually really happy when I learned that it was such an important piece of the digital marketplace, because although I don't, I don't truly, I don't use it that much at a personal level, but the only reason I don't is because the advertisements that are all over Pinterest. Yeah. Uh, so when I want a recipe that's paleo and dairy free with my wife, that also tastes good. I go to Pinterest. And then sometimes it takes me 20 minutes, just that's an exaggeration, but it takes me forever to find the actual recipe because it's buried in ads. 
Yeah. But Pinterest really knocks down the boundaries, which is what I love to do. Pinterest knocks down the boundaries of all this creative sharing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you empower that with being in groups and sharing each other's pins. And then you can easily get millions of people seeing your stuff. That's sweet. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I'm pumped to check it out. Yeah. Easy button. (laughs) So can you uh, share some of your client success stories? I'll share the, the easiest one because it's been recent and it's something I really love to do that we haven't really hit on. I'll be brief, but it's hiring. I love helping people with hiring and scaling. It's I I can't do it at a medium and up level, I would say at this point until I have a team. So I don't want to misconstrue where I fall (laughs) in terms of org development and scaling and hiring. But I love, I really love thinking about it. I love processing how to hire extremely well and just all the benefits that can have to your business, whether you're hiring one person for one department or multiple people for across multiple departments, the power of hiring the right person can make such a significant impact in a small business. So like think anything other under a hundred people, you are now a full percent or more of a a person's entire vision and organization. It's really powerful, the role you have there. So I'm helping understand what that means to a business owner. And I have that and it's great expectations. It's a physical speech and occupational therapy clinic in upstate New York in the middle of nowhere. Uh, near where I grew up. And she's got six open positions right now. And her company is 12 deep. So it's pretty significant. And I got on the phone with her and she's really, really, she's a great human, extremely motivated and very kind hearted, but pretty direct with people stuff. Sometimes gets right to it. And she doesn't hire. She hates the hiring process. And most small business owners do, they truly hate it. And so they don't give it the due attention it deserves. And then they do a respectfully bad job at it most of the time. And that has such negative impacts, both on the vibes they have towards it, because now it's, I hired a bad person and I have to find somebody new. I hate this process. So it just reinforces that it brings down the culture. If you have an established team, it can ruin a culture. If your team is new and small, if you hire the wrong person it is so significant. So I'm working through it with great expectations. And we started with just the backdrop of everything. Why haven't you hired? What, who helps you interview? Going through just the basics. Why don't people come to work for you already? Why have you had trouble with it? And the reason was that she's in the middle of nowhere. Again, it's upstate New York, counties of 10,000 people, not cities, counties of 10,000 people. And so historically, traditionally, people don't want to move there. New York State has high taxes. There's a lot of things working against New York State, upstate in particular. And it can be kind of boring but we're just coming out of a pandemic. So the first thing we did is stop talking negative about living in the middle of nowhere, because there's a lot of people in LA and a lot of people in New York city that wanted to live somewhere away from all the chaos because you were locked away for so long. And that was, I imagine I I had a patio, but some people didn't have a patio during COVID and we're just locked away for all that time. And so I really started early on in the process, working that out of our language because that's a selling point that you have now. For all of eternity, it's been something that gets in your way. Now it's a selling point, but we have to make it one in your posting. We have to make it one in your interview. Your language has to be positive. So we get the mindset right. (laughs) And then we work on the posting. We get the posting right. How do we wanna weed people out? We're gonna put our value statement and our inclusivity statement really close to the top of the posting. That way you don't get people that don't align with your business. Because once they see that, and if they're drastically the other way, they're just going to avoid it. There are certain people, if they see an inclusivity statement at the top of a posting, they're going to walk the other way. And that's okay. You just saved us a bunch of time because it's not going to align with the core of that human and the core of that business. So those are the things I've been working on with great expectations. She's already got some applicants. We, we posted it for the whole state this time instead of just her region because I wanted to encourage her to try to reel people in from Buffalo and Rochester and New York City and Binghamton and Auburn, some of these bigger cities within the whole state of New York, rather than just the people who graduated from a local college. Because she was only drawing from the local colleges and that's a really limited, a limited scope of people. And I wanted her to be able to hire somebody that was excited to work with her not who was just working with her because it was convenient because that I worked at a business where that changed our business only for the better 
And I wanted that for them too. And we are on our way. We are on our way. So we're mid process with that, but it's super fun. I just really enjoy doing that because both parties get so much out of it. You have a business owner that feels they are under control with their staffing. You have a business owner that feels their values are being represented in who they get to hire. And they don't hate it because they don't have to do it all by themselves. And they hire somebody. They, if you hire somebody that could be your friend, you're probably going to enjoy what you do, whether you're a business owner or a coworker. I just, I love that process because it can be so impactful. What do you think has been your truth that has gotten you this far in your journey? Plants. I'm not going to overthink this one. Everywhere I go, <laughs> there is always the background that I carry with me. And I'm very grateful for it. As I grew up on a, a produce farm in upstate New York, I had uh, divorced parents beyond the analogy of a plant. There was just so many things in my really early life that set me up for success if I wanted to take it and my brothers as well. And so everywhere I go, the one thing that really hasn't changed is growing things and preferably plants. <laughs> I just, I keep it as my core. It's my truth. It's an identity that I can latch onto enough to not have it control my life anymore because early on it did. I thought I was going to be this person that was just everybody else in my family. And I used that springboard for something different, but I always keep it really close. It's the tattoo I have. I don't know. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. All right. So I have this tattoo of a pumpkin that's just popped up out of the ground and it still has a little seed fragment left on it. You can see the roots, but it's brand new. And the reason I went with that, it's the only tattoo I currently have, partly because I moved to San Diego and you have to have a tattoo to be okay here. <laughs> uh, everybody here has got ink. It's great. But partly because it was the only thing I could possibly think of that I was never going to regret having inked on my body. And that pumpkin was the first thing my dad let me grow and sell on my own. And um, those so, are not easy. No, I was, but I didn't do I anything. Tried. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up, I was a fourth generation farm kid. So I had so many resources to help me excel at that. Yeah. Uh, so I always keep plants and roots. That's really neat. So if you were able to give yourself one piece of advice when you first started out in your journey, what would it be? That's a tough one. I don't know how I could ever convince myself of doing things sooner. I think because most things that I transitioned to in my life, I think I knew well before it just took forever for somebody to sell it to me in a way that I could digest, which is my own fault. I don't know. I wish I really, I really wish that I would just push myself out the door sometimes. And I wish I had started doing that sooner. It's like sometimes just leave for no reason literally walk out the house and go get a coffee somewhere else instead of making your own to save a dollar 50 today because i love human interaction and i love learning about people and and it's not every time you meet somebody impactful at the coffee shop but sometimes yeah. you do yeah. <laughs> sometimes you meet somebody that could be a really powerful conversation yeah and so i wish for myself that i would start doing that really early on because it's a cool world and there's a lot of cool people to talk to Trevor, there are people that are listening that would love to work with you. What's the best way to contact you? The best way would be to honestly, to email me, Trevor at commonleaders.com, um, which I'm sure we can hyperlink in the show notes. That yeah. is the best way. I haven't signed up for a lot of things on it and I organize all the spam. So if you're not spam, I'll definitely see it. And I, I have my own podcast, uh, which I'd love to have you on. I, it's kind of been bubbling the last couple of months by bubbling. And I don't mean in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> We're readjusting some things, but I do have a podcast that is taking a, a big reshape. That's really why there's been a pause is I've been extremely busy while also trying to reformat it. And that's called the common leaders podcast. Super easy to find. I have a couple of interns that have recently posted episodes and I'm super proud of them because they added it themselves in the whole bit. Yeah. And honestly, just reach out, even if it's on social media, it's everything's at common leaders. So it's really easy to find. There's nothing that's related to the term common leaders as a business that wouldn't be related to me. Okay. Perfect. So, and I put your link tree down below as, as well. Sick. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. And thank you again to everybody who might listen and might reach out. Have a great day. Yeah. And if you're listening, you want more information about this podcast and upcoming shows, you can visit a call to thrive.com. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful week.